And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Rupert Reed, strategist, author, deep thinker, systems thinker, and wonderful human being. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. What if I were to say to you, be hopeful, be stubbornly optimistic. It's not too late. We've got the Paris Agreement, governments are getting on side, businesses are getting on side. It's five minutes to midnight. There's everything to play for. Let's all pull together. We can do this. Nothing really bad is going to happen. Everything is going to be okay. In fact, we've got this brilliant technology lined up, which is going to pull untold amounts of carbon down from the atmosphere. So really, nothing very bad has happened yet, because anything bad that has happened, we can undo that, we can draw it all down. Everything's going to be fine. Would you believe me? And even if you wanted to believe me, would you actually be energized? Would this message fill you with determination? Would it make you more capable of acting? What if I were to say to you, it's over. We're fucked. We're doomed. There's nothing we can do. We've left it too late. Governments have completely done it in. There's nothing we can do. It's the end days. It's the end game. Would you believe me? And even if you did believe me, would such a message fill you with determination? to act and to do something to make things better, at least to make things less bad. Because surely it's always possible to make things less bad, isn't it? It's always, it's always possible at the very least to reduce the harm. What if I were to say to you, it's not five to midnight. It's not even one minute to midnight. It's five past midnight. But here's the good news. It's only five past midnight. It's not the end of time. It's not the end days. It's not all over. There's no proof that we're actually doomed. There's no proof that human beings are going to go extinct, or that there won't be any future civilization. You have been very badly let down. We are no longer in the safe zone. That's true. We are in the age of consequences. Very bad things are happening already. Worse things are going to carry on happening for a long time. The 1.5 degrees that the 5 to midnight people keep talking about, that is gone. We were told that we needed to stay below 1.5 degrees to stay, to stay safe. We're not safe any longer. You've been let down. Your trust has been betrayed. We cannot trust our leaders to lead us through this. We may have to do it ourselves. What if I was to say something like that to you? Would you believe me? Yeah. Mm. And perhaps even more important, would it be a platform from which you could develop some agency, some sense of what we can do together, some sense of, based on reality, based on a hard look into reality, what we can do together in this situation to deal with this terrible, unprecedented crisis that our so-called leaders have dropped us 
into. Would that give you some sense of a potential collective agency and perhaps of determination to do what we can? Yeah. Good, because that's what I'm going to be telling you. <laughs> that's where we are. It's five past midnight, but the good news is it's only five past midnight. The Pollyanna people, the five to midnight people say, it's not too late. The doommongers say, it's too late. But neither side asks the requisite question. Too late for what? And not too late for what? So there are plenty of things it is now too late for. Yeah, that's true. It is too late for a smooth transition. We are in for a very bumpy ride. It is too late, tragically and appallingly, to stay in the safe zone, to stay below 1.5 degrees. It is too late to trust that others are going to sort this out for us. It is too late to outsource this to the so-called leaders. And in fact, even some of the scientists have let us down because they've been pretending that everything is going to be fine and the process can be trusted. And actually, it's too late for that. But there are many things also that it is not too late for. It is not too late for there to be a human civilization that can be sustained. It is probably not too late for us to transform this civilization into a better one without enduring collapse. It is probably not too late to stop us going over two degrees of global overheat, which will be a lot better than not stopping ourselves from going over two degrees of global overheat. It is not too late, it is never too late to reduce harm. It is never too late to do the right thing, regardless of outcome. We can't control the outcome, but we can control how we act. We can control how we behave towards each other. We can control what we attempt to do, what we aim for. It's never too late to do the right thing. It's never too late to preserve our dignity. It's never too late to work together for a better future, or if not a better future, at least a less bad future than will otherwise come if we don't act together. So whenever you hear anybody say, it's too late, or it's not too late, make sure they specify for what, because that's where the real questions begin and that's where the real work begins. Letting go, sometimes very painfully, of the things it is too late for, and striving with determination together for the things it's not too late for. So that is where we're at. And that is why we're here today. What are we to do? Where are we to start? What is our point of departure for the action that follows from this kind of diagnosis? From the painful work of accepting the five past midnight truth. People sometimes say to me, Rupert, what can I as an individual do? And I say, don't be an individual. Right. Individual action alone is going to be too little. It's important, but it's not important enough. It's not enough. Work on the micro level alone is no way it's going to be enough. But what about the macro level, the level of states? Hugely important, right? Much that we can do with our vote. For example, this conservative cabal has to go. Uh, encouraging news from the by-elections the other night. Um, we need also to have many more votes for politicians such as Greens who really do take this issue, the determinative issue of our time, uh, seriously. And all other politicians of good faith who are serious about putting this front and centre. Of course, what happens in politics in democratic processes, in governments, is important. But is it enough? Well, remember the, the centerpiece of what I said a few minutes ago. Politics as usual is exactly what has let us down and what and continues to let us down. We were told that if we stayed below 1.5 degrees, we would be in the safe zone. We are not going to stay below 1.5 degrees. How do I know? I'm an IPCC expert reviewer, and as you may have heard in the recent IPCC reports, they said we need, quote, deep and immediate cuts worldwide to stay below the 1.5 degrees target. 
And when they were asked what they meant by immediate, they said, starting this year. What is happening this year? Britain, we still have the COP presidency. We're ramping up fossil fuel production. America is ramping up fossil fuel production. Biden has given more licenses for new fossil fuel production than Trump did. Russia, unsurprisingly, is ramping up fossil fuel uh, production. Some European countries are making some encouraging moves to move away from their fossil fuel dependency, but it's nowhere near enough. Deep and immediate cuts worldwide are no more going to occur than Trump and Boris Johnson are going to convert overnight to Buddhism. <laughs> that is the reality of the situation. So we cannot trust governments to hold this. They are the ones who have let us down the most of all. And what that means is that, of course, it's absolutely important that we work at the political level, we work on policy makers, we work, some of us, to become uh, elected politicians ourselves. It's very important we use our vote widely. It's very important we participate in politics much more widely and deeply than that. Politics is not about voting alone. But to expect that states alone are going to sort this is, well, it's the, defin the old definition of insanity, isn't it? It's doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for different results. Our so-called leaders are not going to lead us out of this. They need to be led out of this by us. So the macro level should sort this, but is not going to. We've had 26 COPs, climate COPs. There's no reason to believe that the 27th is going to be any more effective. And the only way it will, the only way it could conceivably be, is if it is put under an untold level of new pressure from civil society. What is civil society? Well, look around the room, folks. This is, uh, this is us. This is where it's at. The meso level, the level in between the micro and the macro, if real change is going to come, that's where it's going to be led from. And I want to suggest to you in particular two venues, two aspects of that meso level which are going to be of critical importance. One is geographical communities, where we live. Right? People in their neighborhoods, in their parishes, town councils, etc. People on their streets, people perhaps banding together to grow food together, to give ourselves some kind of buffer against the terribly dangerous times that are coming. Uh, the Ukraine crisis is likely to be um, a dry run for the food crises coming uh, in future years. Uh, as our weather continues to um, accelerate into uh, terra incognita. We need to be organizing where we live together as we've never done before, at a scale that we've never done before. And it's very encouraging that that is going to be, as I understand it, the number one topic here this afternoon, and that the speakers who follow me will be talking quite a lot about uh, that. Um, what we do together where we live is going to be potentially determinative of whether or not we have a future. And the other area is where we work. And I think this has been the most neglected of all, actually. Our labor power, our power as professionals, some of us, uh, our power as business people, uh, some of us, um, or our power through professional organizations, through trades unions, through business councils, through uh, round round tables, federation of small businesses, etc., etc. Many of you in this room have some kind of power under that heading. Nearly all adults still today spend half of their waking hours during the week at work. They might be at home while they do it, but they're at work. We're at work. If we're working from home, we're still at work, right? Workplaces are a huge, huge opportunity. There are so many aspects of them that have to be transformed. One of the reasons why geographical communities are absolutely critical is because they are the way we can bring home to ourselves and to other people the vulnerability, the unsafety that we are now in. If you just talk to people about 2050, about mitigation, about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, it still sounds an awful long way off to most people. If you start saying to people, you know what, we're going to grow more food right here, right now, together, because we're worried about the vulnerability that we're entering into with Ukraine, with these 
uh, weather crises that are exploding with the uh, growing instability around the world, partly as a result of the endlessly ramping up climate crisis. If you say that to people, and if you, start, if you show that you mean it by actually doing it, then a mind bomb starts to go off in people's heads. Wow, it, it, it's, it's really happening. People mean it. They, they mean it. They're, they're not just talking about some far-off distant date. They're talking about now, and they're doing something about it. It changes people's minds. The same applies in businesses. There's a whole agenda of adaptation and resilience for businesses, for institutions, for workplaces. How reliable is your supply line? How reliable are your premises? Yeah, I, I was speaking recently to a, a green-leaning uh, food business. They had an interesting experience last summer in the brief heat wave you may remember we had last summer, quite severe heat wave. They're a food business, right? They rely on refrigerating things and transporting them and so on. They found out that their air conditioning cut out at 34 degrees centigrade. It just simply stopped working, that temperature. It's designed to work in temperatures up to 34 degrees. That was an interesting revelation for them. That showed them something about their lack of resilience. This is what adaptation actually means. It's a whole agenda. And then there's a whole agenda of mitigation also for businesses and institutions and workplaces. Everything from where is your work located? What are you doing to reduce commuting? To what is your product? Is it making the world a better place? What are you doing with your profits? What are you doing with your lobbying power? This is absolutely critical. Lobbying is not something that businesses do as a sort of accident or a sort of uh, voluntary additional activity. It's a central part of what they do. Right. It's, it's how they give themselves a good working environment and how they put themselves in a position to get an edge on others. Traditionally, what most businesses have lobbied for is regulatory exemptions, loopholes, lower taxes, etc. Now, just imagine for a second that you had a group of businesses and then a large group and then a larger group that were lobbying for the opposite. Imagine them lobbying for a higher level playing field for everybody. Imagine them saying, we want to be taxed more in such and such a way such that you will act with the proceeds to defend us against what's coming down the track to help us to mitigate, to help us to adapt. That again would be a mind bomb. That would be a real story. That would be man bites dog territory. Yeah? If businesses were to turn around and say, we are ashamed and furious that governments have let us down. We want you to, lob to, to regulate us better so that together we have a future. So many aspects of where we work that require to be changed. And we can change them. We can change them through professional associations, through trades unions, through um, um, stakeholder engagement, through uh, organizing, uh, through uh, activism, through action of whatever kind. It doesn't have to be action, activism as such. So, geographic communities and workplaces. Those are the two central locales, there are many others, but those are the two central locales, in my view, of what I'm calling the moderate flank. This is what we need now. The radical flank, which some of you in this room probably have been involved with in the last few years, and I was myself, Extinction Rebellion, etc., achieved something fantastic in 2019. Achieved a shifting of consciousness, moved the agenda, made climate denial something which was no longer legitimate in countries like this one, no longer a possible position uh, to take up. But it needs to be followed up. It needs to be followed up by real action at scale. And that's why we need what I'm calling a moderate flank. That's why we need people to take action at scale in real ge geographic communities, in workplaces, to make it real, to make it happen, to make those changes. We cannot rely on governments to do it for us, but if we lead from the ground up, then we'll be pressurizing them in the best way that we possibly can, as well as achieving change in the most direct way that we possibly can. Okay, I want to leave plenty of time for discussion because there's 
a lot already in what you've heard from myself and from Kim. Before moving towards a conclusion, I want to say one thing which is of critical importance. Some of you will be persuaded by what you've heard. Some of you won't have need, needed persuading. Some of you will already be there. The radical flank, as I say, has moved the agenda. It's made space for there to be a moderate flank of the kind that I've just outlined. Many of you will already be feeling it. The five past midnight story is, I would argue, our best basis for encouraging more people to feel it and to really understand and to really take it in and to really be determined and motivated to make the changes that are necessary. But if you need further reason to take the kind of action that I've started to sketch here and that you'll hear more about as this afternoon progresses, then I want you to consider the following. I want you to consider where we may be at in about a generation's time, in about 20 years' time. And there are various possible futures depending on what people like us do. In some of these futures, things will be kind of okay, we'll be muddling through. In other of these futures, things will be very dire. We don't have full control over whether, whether either of these things happen. We can try to influence things in the direction of one or the other. What we do, as I started out by saying, have control over whether we try to move things in one of those directions or the other. And there's something else that will be happening in about 20 years' time, which is that the younger generation will be coming to us and they'll be, they'll be looking for a new kind of reckoning themselves. And if things are very dire, they'll be asking you, what did you do while there was still time? And if things are not so bad, they'll be asking you, how did you help to execute this very difficult transition? And whichever of those futures we're in, you want to be able to turn around and look them in the eye and say that you did all that you could. And the importance of this really can't be overestimated. The only thing, the only thing that our children and our nephews and nieces and our grandchildren are going to be asking us in 20 years' time is, what did you do while there was still time? Or how did you help to make that transition? They won't be interested in anything else. Most of the minutiae of present day politics, for example, they'll have no interest in whatsoever. They will only be interested in this question. And you will either be in a position where you will be feeling ashamed of the inadequacy of your answer, or you'll be in a better position. So that's really what, if you've got any doubt about whether or not to throw yourself into the kind of action that I'm talking about, if you're not doing so already, and if you are doing so already, to take it to the next level, to consider what more you can do, what more you can do by way of putting your body on the line, or putting your money on the line, or putting your time, your, your commitment, your energy on the line. When you're coming to ask yourself about that, consider whether you are determined to be in a position to not feel ashamed in front of the younger generation. And the alternative is pretty great, actually. The alternative is that win or lose, whether things are really shit or whether they're kind of okay, you'll be able to feel proud. Wouldn't that be just great? To be able to, to look them in the eye, put your hand on your heart and say, I really did what I could. Whether things are quite good or very shit, wouldn't that be great, to be able to be proud? So what are we waiting for? Thank you.